Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. We will be learning about memory. We're now on Chapter 7 from your textbook. Let's take a look at the lecture schedule. Here's what's in your syllabus, and then the colored blocks here show the adapted lecture schedule because I've been getting through um, the, the chapters more quickly than the previous instructor did, whose course format I've been using. So we will um, be on this chapter seven about memory from today ending next week on the 15th which is right before the midterm and if by any chance i were to get through these lectures more quickly than planned then i would use that as a midterm review session okay so let's get started with memory last chapter was on learning okay so we learned about learning which is how information gets into your head and once it's in there memory is about how it stays in there it's about retention how the learned information is retained the adaptive function of your memory is that it informs you towards appropriate action because you have a memory you do something differently perhaps than if you had had no memory. You do things that have helped you in the past. Right? You avoid doing things again that have hurt you in the past. You avoid stimuli, people that have hurt you in the past because of your memory. You decide where to go based on your spatial memory of location. You follow social scripts that you've learned so that you do what other people expect you to do. We think of memory as an objective information bank. We can put information into and then retrieve later in the same form, in the same way as we put it in. That's not really the way it works. When you pull up an, an episodic memory, and episodic memory refers to your memory for personal events in your life. It's not like pulling up an, an image or a document from a computer, looking at it again, and then putting it away, okay? It, the memory itself may decay, get up mixed up with other related memory and things that you imagined, and your mind fills in the blanks with new information that feels meaningful or would somehow be expected. Maybe because of the, the kind of questions that somebody is asking you about it. Sometimes those are leading questions. And so it's like you pull up the document and, and then you edit it and, and you resave it. And so memories change over time. Our memories can be very, very good in some cases and very poor in others. That's paradoxical. Overall, the constructive characteristic of memory, the, the way it changes and, and shifts, is, is adaptive. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that, that characteristic. So there's, there's a lot of gaps in, in your attention. And when we construct a memory, our minds fill in the gaps with information that we would expect to be true and we may really believe that that it is true and the way our minds fill in the gaps is well it's often right and the, over the course of evolutionary history it's, it's it's been more right than wrong and that's why we have that characteristic some people remember things from other people's perspectives as if they were someone else watching them from the outside. So in these pictures, if, if you're the kid having the birthday party, you'd see the table in front of you. But some folks have a memory, let's say that the kid having the birthday party is, is this boy over here. They might remember it as if it were, were filmed or photographed by, by someone else. I've 
read about this in the this phenomenon in the introductory psychology textbooks that that I've read about three of them. So it's asserted to me that this is a real phenomenon. I've um, never experienced it myself. I always have that first person view. Does anyone does this relate to anyone? Does anyone do this? Okay, so there is somebody who who's remembered it it the second way um, from from other people's perspective. So yes, it is a phenomenon, and doing that is actually more common in people from collectivistic societies who take the perspective of others. All right, there's I see another chat from a student who who also does that, and I wonder, you know, are you folks more like other oriented? Are you more empathetic? And and there's a third person who does that. Yeah, I've I've never done that. I've always um always seen from remembered things from from my own perspective. And I'm I'm a, a very independent person. So I, I wonder if there's there's like personality differences there on the trait factor of sort of agreeableness or independence, dominance versus submission. Be interesting to research. Uh, and there's a, a question, uh, there's a I'm reading the chat here and yeah, there's so there's a few other people who are saying that they um, have their memories are like that. And I see a question from Charmaine saying, is that kind of like a, a third POV point of view? It's yeah, it's the point of view of a third party of an outsider looking in. But that can't be your encoding, your original encoding of the event, because you would be looking at things through your own eyes. And if your memory is of, you know, if you see yourself in your memory as if you were somebody else looking in, well, then you had to construct that because that was never what you saw through your own eyes. So that tells us something about the constructive nature of memory. And there's a, a comment from somebody who has this uh, type of recollection saying, I grew up in a very communal area and have always been kind of the mom and friend person. So yeah, in this case, the person is more likely to take other people's view. So it, it's an adaptive uh, phenomenon and be interesting to reach that more. And apparently having this kind of memory is like playing Skyrim. I haven't played Skyrim. And some people play this game in first person, but um, Shirley prefers to see the character that's being played. Interesting. So so you even prefer to take that that perspective in, I guess, what, what would be be a video game. So your memory can include sort of a, a manufactured perspective. That doesn't mean you're wrong about the events in, in your memory, but it does show, it demonstrates the constructive nature of memory. There are three kinds of memory, three types of memory, according to the, I guess, the atkinson Triffin model. These are sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And today we will learn about sensory memory. These different kinds of memory differ in terms of span and duration. A right? sensory memory is super short. It really refers to your body registering incoming sensory information and your body's being bombarded with that all the time. So right now, your ears are picking up all kinds of different sounds, even though you're, you're focused on my voice. There, there may be room sounds behind you. Um, you know, you, you can, can feel something like the feeling of the clothes on your body or your, your hair moving around. There are smells around you. Uh, your body's in a certain position and you have proprioceptors that, that tell you what position your body is in. And you have all that information coming in and you're only aware of a very small amount. So you don't remember most of that. So let's say there's, um, well, there's cars passing on the street outside my window. 
and my ears, my, the sensory receptors in, in my ears are, are picking picking up that sound, but I'm not going to remember that. Okay? It, it's not even making it into my short-term memory because I'm not aware of it. And short-term memory is a longer um, memory process. When I say longer, I don't mean a lot longer. So sensory memory might last up to usually like maybe a second or two. Short-term memory, you're looking at about 30 seconds tops of what you're focused on. And then only some of that makes it into long-term memory. So think of, well, you know, the, the 7th of March, 2004. What were you doing? You don't know. You've forgotten. But on that date, the 7th of March, 2004, you were you were doing something, right? And and you were aware. Okay? You're but it it, it didn't make it into your long-term memory store. So at each stage, so sensory memory feeds into short-term memory and short-term memory feeds into long-term memory. Um, but but at each step, you're losing a lot of information. And what finally makes it into your long-term memory is a lot less than than what was the inf than all the information that was ever coming into your body. And and I'm going to look at the chat now because I see there's some questions. And um, Shelby asked, would dreams also be normal to be in the third person, or do some people dream in the first person? Just curious. Interesting question. Um, all my memories are in the first person. And and I think I've had dreams in the third person. <laughs> but I don't know that anyone's ever researched this. And, you know, if you're interested in, in psychology, there's you know, an honors program and, you know, you could do a, a research project on this. So I don't know, but it's interesting to think about. Oh, apparently 2004 was was not a, a good date to choose because some of you weren't born then. Oh, oh, that's true for many people. OK, I tried to pick a date that, you know, would work for everyone. I was in high school. <laughs> then, but apparently I don't realize how old I am. And uh, I'm seeing a chat uh, from Shirley saying that, that she dreams in, in the third person. And Jane always dreams and remembers in the first person, but also has a photographic memory. Photographic memory is, uh, is interesting. We'll, we'll talk about that. It's in, it's in your textbook, but some people can um, retain... An, an image of something as if it were a, a photograph and then consult that image and report details that other people just wouldn't be able to do. Okay, so 2004 was the wrong date. Let's let's go with 2014. Okay, so on March the 7th, 2014, you were doing something, you were aware of what was going on, you're being conscious and rational, but um, that date, what you did on that day just didn't make it into your long-term memory because you can't remember it now, right? You might be able to guess what you did. You'd be like, oh, I was in grade such and such, so I must have been, you know, living in this place and going to that school. And, and you might have, you know, memories of grade four and, and who was your friend, but unlikely to be of that specific date. But my point being is that we lose a lot of the information that we're exposed to, right? We we retain only a small fraction of it. Now, here's another question in the chat. Quick question. If there's something that has happened at some point in your life that you don't remember, but that others have brought up consistent to you, is it normal to make something that you consider, sorry, is it normal to make up something that you consider a memory based on the stories they told despite not actually remembering the incident? Yes, it is. And uh, researchers have been able to implant false memories using um, that, that exact technique, just telling them about a time that they were lost in, in a mall, right? That never happened. And even when the participants were debriefed and told that, that you know, this is an experiment and, and that didn't actually happen, they I passionately insist that that really happened. So um, 
on today's lecture, we will talk about short-term memory, and that brings me to about slide 13, which will be a good stopping point, and then we'll talk about um, long-term memory at uh, next class. So we'll talk about, I think, probably sensory and short-term today. So sensory memory is refers to your sensory receptors grabbing information from the world and holding on to it for a very brief time, right? It may or may not make it up to short-term memory, which is the next level. So if you flash letters at people like this for about one second after the image is gone, people could still tell you if you asked them what numbers were in the fourth row, they would be able to repeat back some of those letters to you. Okay, so you can say you flash that for one second and took it away, ask them a question. Okay, they can remember for a super short time. So each sense has its own form of sensory memory. And about three of these forms of sensory memory have been researched, but there's more than that. So memory for visual stimuli is called iconic memory. And it lasts about one second. In the kind of research where you would show this for a second and then ask the person what they saw, the very act of asking the question would cause them to run out of time. So what they do is they teach people that if you they hear a tone, that tone means, you know, report what was in the third row. Because there's, you know, so that they, show the image, play the tone, and the person would report because there just isn't, isn't the time to say the words to ask that, you know, a, a sentence long question. Memory for touch is called haptic memory and it lasts about two seconds. So I take this pen, I'll touch my hand, okay, and take the pen away, I can still feel that. Does that work for you guys? Yeah, kind of cool. It's gone and I'm still feeling it. That's that's your haptic memory. And two seconds is a fair amount of time, right? It's one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Memory for the position of your body is called proprioceptive memory. And that lasts two to four seconds. And researchers have, have tested that by, you know, asking people to move back to an earlier position. And people seem to remember whatever that was for two to four seconds. Memory for auditory stimuli is called echoic memory. And it lasts an impressive, like, five to ten seconds. That is a really long time. Um, the, the five to ten second estimate is, is longer than other ones I've seen. I've, I've seen four. Sorry, my phone is uh, making some noise here. And I'm the one that needs to turn off my sound here. That was my best friend texting me. Um, all right. Where was I? Okay, echoic memory lasts an impressively long time, okay? Five seconds is a long time. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. And um, and I, I see that, you know, there, it may be shorter or longer for, for some people. So, you know, maybe for you, it's like three seconds, maybe for someone else, it's 10 seconds. But it is a lot longer than your other kinds of sensory memory. And so here's a phenomenon you may have experienced. So let's say you are not focused, right, on somebody who's talking to you, right? Maybe it's your friend, maybe it's the, the teacher, they're going blah, 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 okay, and you're tuned out. And then they realize that you're not listening, right? And, and they're like, you know, are you listening? 
And you're like, yes, I, yeah, I was totally listening. And they say, well, you know, what was I talking about? And you can still access your echoic store because like 10 seconds is a long time. And so you can tell them what they just said to you. You can repeat it back. And then it sounds like you were listening, but actually you weren't. And you can't remember what they said, you know, 15 seconds ago. Um, question from Shirley is echoic memory the thing that's happening when I hear the constant ringing of an alarm or ringtone long after it's been turned off? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it could be other things too, but that could that's a plausible explanation. I, I could be wrong though. I'm not a neuroscientist. No, I know that sometimes with vision there are after images. And this slide, um, which originally came from the textbook publisher, um, didn't have this picture of the array of letters. I found that myself. Before that, it had a lightning strike. And I thought, yeah, you know, if you were to look at a lightning bolt, you would have like an after image, but I don't know that that's sensory memory. Right. So that's why I took it off. So maybe, maybe, maybe not. Short term memory is the next level up from sensory memory. Okay. And that memory system retains information for limited durations. It's basically what you're focusing on right now before you shift your attention again. And so it lasts for something like five to 20 seconds. Uh, you know, an upper limit, maximum upper limit would be like 30 seconds. But short term memory does not reach into like minutes. Um, you will hear people misuse this term a lot. They'll say, oh, you know, I, I can't remember if um, if I had lunch today. I, I have a problem with my short term memory. But they're talking about durations that are too long to apply to short term memory. Somebody who has profound short term memory loss would not form no, I'm, I didn't express that the right way. There's some folks who have sensory and short-term memory, but cannot take their short-term memories and store them as, as long-term memories. And um, people like that would forget what they're doing every like five to 30 seconds. And uh, we'll learn about a couple of famous cases of folks like that. Uh, one of them was a patient known by the initials HM. And if you walked into a room and introduced you, yourself to him, you could have a sort of conversation with him. But if you walked out of the room and came back, he'd think he was meeting you for the first time. Short term memory is related to the concept of working memory. Uh, short term memory and working memory come from, you know, different theories, different papers, different researchers, but who seem to be talking about very similar things. And so you'll see both of these terms and they have a lot of overlap. Uh, working memory adds the idea of the manipulation of information. So you're when you're in, when you're aware of what you're doing, you're aware of, you know, a few things around you. You're holding some information in your mind and you might be manipulating it to do some calculations or computations with it. So working memory adds the concept of, of the manipulation of information. There are two ways that we lose information in our short term memory. This is stated like a blunt fact. I'm going to say it would be better to say research suggests that there are two ways because maybe there's other ways we lose information from short-term memory that we're not aware of. Decay is the idea that it just, it fades over time. And then interference is the idea that we lose information because of competition with an other information. So you think about something else and you forget what you're thinking about before. I see a comment in the chat from Shirley. Color theory is mostly grounded in the concept of an after image. The guy who came up with color theory viewed colors under the off gassing of an oil lamp and the effects the lamp had on the environment changed the color of the after image if he sat with it for too long. 
the shades would be different had he been sitting in the sun when he initially studied this. That is really neat because I, um, you know, when I was teaching you guys about uh, the opponent process stuff, I, I was looking at opposite colors and color theories and some of the things didn't quite make sense to me. So that's uh, that's very interesting. Like, you know, why is the opposite of blue orange, is it? Thank you for that. All right, back to short term memory. So you can lose information due to decay or and or interference. There are two kinds of interference. Retroactive interference happens when learning new information impairs the old information. That's like when you're learning Spanish and that messes up your, your French. Proactive interference happens when earlier, older learning gets in the way of learning something new. I wish I had said remembering, okay? Um, and that might happen to you when you change your number or you change your address, but you keep telling people the old number or address. Okay, because the and and the memory of the old information of the old number is is getting in the way of your ability to uh, recall the new information, and and these types of interference are more likely to happen when the old and new stimuli are similar to each other, like phone numbers. So, how much information can you hold? in your short-term memory at a given time? Well, it seems to be about seven, plus or minus two. You can extend your short-term memory span by using a technique called chunking. So let's look at these two arrays. These are both arrays of 15 letters. And let's say I were to read the letters to you and then ask you to recall them. So in the first case, the array is K, A, C, F, J, N, A, B, I, S, B, C, F, U, I. And imagine I took that away. I said, OK, repeat those those letters back to me. You might be able to remember a few of them probably about, you know, five-ish, and probably those from the beginning or the ends of, of the list. But your um, retention would probably be better for the second list if I asked you to remember the um, these 15 characters. NHL, PEI, CBC, NBA, MLA. And what's going on there is that you can chunk these into acronyms. So NHL is National Hockey League and PEI is Prince Edward Island. And so you could remember this as, um, as five chunks instead of as 15 units. So this becomes five units with three letters each instead of 15. And, and it's quite a, a powerful strategy. And if you really wanted to make yourself remember these, you could link the acronyms to each other into like a little story. That's um, a, a mnemonic device. So, you know, you're, let's say you're trying to remember a list like this, say for an exam. Um, when would you be in a position like that? If you were in a medical, if you were a, like a medical or a pharmacy student, they have to uh, remember a lot of lists. And so you might sit down and come up with a little story. So an NHL player from PEI was interviewed by the CBC, and then they interviewed uh, an NBA player who gave up basketball to become a politician. He's now a member of the Legislative Assembly for Edmonton. When I came up with that, little story, I had to pick a city 
And I picked Edmonton because I, I wanted a recall queue for basketball. It was the only Canadian city I could find on a list of basketball hotspots that also has MLAs. Okay, so when I think of the Edmonton MLA, it'll function to cue me to think of basketball. And that would help me remember the NBA thing had I forgotten it. Okay, and if I really wanted to drive the memory for that list in and make it stick, I draw a picture of that story. So uh, what I did with that little story about the CBC interviews in Edmonton is called elaborative rehearsal. Okay, You're trying to remember the stimuli by linking them to each other in a meaningful way. And that's a, a more effective strategy than maintenance rehearsal, which is simply repeating it to yourself in, in the same form. Okay, you might do that with um, a phone number. Say you're, you're trying to remember a phone number until you die it. So you're like, okay, it's 902 And you keep doing that in, until, you, until you call the number. But that is not as effective as a strategy as elaborative rehearsal. But it's, it's good enough for, for its purposes. According to the levels of processing model, our ability to recall information is related to how deeply we process the information. And there are three levels of processing, visual, phonological, sound related, and semantic. Semantic is about meaning. So when I came up with that little strategy to remember that list of acronyms, I made it like a meaningful story. And according to this theory, semantic processing is based on meaning is the deepest level. Um, and so if you're trying to remember this sentence here, uh, the visual level would be like what the letters look like. The phonological would be what the words sound like. And the semantic is what it actually means. That said, uh, this is a theory. It can be criticized. Like, you know, what, what do you mean by deep? How do you know that phonological processing is deeper than visual? Uh, you know, we we recall things for, for different reasons. Um, one is because things can be associated with strong emotions. You know, um, another reason is because what we're trying to remember somehow hooks into information that we already know so that it all makes sense. Um, Long term memory refers to our relatively enduring store of information goes from about that, you know, half a minute to many years to the rest of your life and the memories that last for years and years and years are called the perma store it includes everything that you know all the facts you know right what what is the capital of, of canada you know, the answer to that question is is in your long-term memory bank it includes all the experiences of, of your life that you remember. That's called your episodic memory. Your memory for facts is called your semantic memory. Then you also have um, a memory for, for skills, for, yeah, for physical skills that you've learned. So if you know how to ride a bicycle, well, you learned how to do that, and that information stayed in there somehow, right? You, you get on a bicycle and you know what to do. You know how to balance. That's called your procedural memory. And it's um, implicit rather than explicit. So you can tell me about facts in, in that you know. You can tell me about um, your experiences, but you may not have any ability to explain things that you just know how to do. So it's called, it's part of your implicit memory. 
long-term memory errors tend to be semantic and meaning related. And the error, but the errors that people make in short-term memory tend to be about the look or sound of the word. And that is some evidence for this levels of processing idea. So if somebody um, makes an error in their short-term memory, it might be because they, they mishear something. Right, like one, they mistook one word for a similar sounding word. Whereas long-term memory errors tend to be more about, some more how connected to the, the meaning of events. Like you might put somebody in your memory that wasn't there originally, but their presence would be, would create a meaningful story. We are more likely to have long-term st storage of stimuli that are presented first in a list. That's called the primacy effect. So if you go to a networking event and you're meeting all kinds of people, you're more likely to remember the first people you met. And then also you're more likely to remember the last people you met than the people you met in the middle, unless there was something really distinctive about them. Okay, so primacy, the primacy effect is your bias to remember stimuli that are presented first, and the recency effect is our bias to remember things that, that were most recently presented. So your long-term memory is divided into your explicit memory and your implicit memory. Your explicit memory includes your semantic and your episodic memory. Explicit memory is also known as declarative memory. You can tell me about these memories in words. Semantic memory refers to your knowledge of facts. And then episodic memory is your memory for things that you've experienced. Now let's take a look at your implicit memory. You may not be conscious of your implicit memory at all. You just have it. That includes your procedural memory. It's your memory for things you know how to do, like ride a bicycle. It includes priming effects. What is a priming effect? Okay, I'm going to play a little game with you guys. So pay attention. I'm going to ask you a, a short series of questions and I want you to type the answer in the chat or you can turn your microphone on and, and say it, but just answer as quickly as, as you can, okay? On, on um, I think it's about five, okay. So here we go. So what color is snow? Not that hard. What color are clouds? What color is whipped cream? What color are polar bears? What do cows drink? <laughs> That's a priming effect. Good job, everyone. <laughs> so many of, of you answered milk. And why did you answer milk? So milk, the concept of milk is connected to two things. It's connected to the idea of white. And I asked you a bunch of questions that made you think of white. And then I'm also talking about a cow. And what else do you associate cows with? Well, milk. And so when I ask you the question about what do they drink, and the idea of drink is even, you know, connected to milk. But the fact that I have previously primed you with the words white and cow just set you up to answer milk. 
Exactly. So that's an example of priming, and it's a form of implicit memory. So you guys answered um, milk and didn't even kind of realize it was wrong for, for like a few seconds. Okay. So that's a priming effect, and it's part of your implicit memory. Then there's conditioning, right? Remember, we learned about uh, classical and operant conditioning in you in the last class. Classical conditioning is definitely part of your implicit memory. I'm not sure about operant conditioning, and I suspect it might be explicit, but definitely classical conditioning. We know that we can classically condition um, animals that are next to brainless, like sea slugs, and people who are unconscious can be conditioned, classically conditioned, so they can show um, eye blink responses. Basically, if you shoot a puff of air at uh, someone's eye, it, it makes you um, makes you blink. And you can, if you give people a, a cue that you're going to do that, they might they might blink. Get a condition. Blink is a conditioned response, and and this happens with. Um, yeah, with people who are who are unconscious and then closely related form of very simple form of learning is is habituation and habituation is when you respond less and less to a stimuli over time so it's not really important so maybe the next time you blow a puff of air at somebody's eye they, they don't blink as hard or as quickly so those are the four kinds of implicit memory Now, we've learned that there's three types of memory, uh, sensory, short-term, and long-term. There are three stages, processes for memory as well. And those are encoding, storage, and retrieval. And encoding applies um, to the, the shorter forms of memory. And retrieval, when we talk about retrieval, we're usually we're testing people's long-term memory. We can test short-term memory too, but that's often what they mean. Anyway, encoding, storing, ret storage, and retrieval are the three processes of memory. Encoding is about getting information in to the memory system. There's a lot of things that we forget or we don't know because we actually just encoded them. Storage is the process of retaining encoded information over time. And retrieval is the process of getting information out of your memory storage. Encoding depends on attention. And when you're paying attention, you're, you're engaging your working memory. Right? Most events that we experience are just never encoded. They'll be picked up uh, by your sensory receptors. They'll make it into your sensory memory, but not up to short-term or working memory. Many mnemonic devices, and we'll talk about these later, there are strategies to remember, like with that example I did with, with the acronym, somehow involve linking the new information that you're trying to encode into meaningful concepts that are already stored in your long-term memory. It's like trying to, trying to hook it in. That's a, those mnemonic devices or strategies that help with encoding. A good way to do that is also to make the information personally relevant. So when you're studying something, you're trying to remember it, ask yourself, is there some way that it relates to you? Is it somehow relevant to your own life history? Okay, and then you can link it into your episodic memory. So storage refers to keeping the information in your memory. And we can ask, can stored memories decay? Well, we absolutely know that's true for short-term memory because you can't ask somebody who wasn't listening about what they heard 20 seconds ago 
And you can ask people to look at a list of words and then take it away. And they can only remember it for, you know, a, a short time. So it's definitely true that our sensory memory decays very quickly, right? Like on the order of, you know, two seconds. And it's true that our short term memories decay on the order of about like, I don't know, maybe 20 seconds. But it's unclear for long term memory because if somebody can't pull up a long term memory, well, is that because it decayed while it was in storage? Or is that because of interference? Or is that because they you just can't retrieve it for some reason? Is it a, is it a retrieval problem? Storage um, depends on our interpretations and expectations. We have schemas that are organized knowledge structures or mental models that you've stored in, in your memory. So you have a, a schema, an expectation, there's a cultural script for what weddings are like and what are the, the order of things that happen as at a wedding. So even if you can't remember all the details from a particular friend's wedding that you that you experienced, what you're likely to do is pull in information from your general understanding of weddings. So you assume that, well, you know, the, the bride must have walked down the aisle and then maybe you can imagine your friend doing that. You might have even lost, not seen that, but it, that event kind of could work its way in through the schema. And these schemas are, are useful, but, you know, they, they can be misleading. And here's another problem, stereotypes are also schemas. So when, you know, it was a tragic case in the States where a, a young black man had Skittles in, in his pocket, but somebody remembered that as a gun, must drawing on, on, a, on a schema of black men as violent. There, according to the Atkinson Schriffen, I'm probably mispronouncing that model of memory. There's no storage limit to long term memory. You can just keep putting things in there. Again, that's theoretical. I don't know how you would test that. But in this model, uh, you can keep putting things in, in your long term memory, but it's like sticking things in the attic. You might not be able to find them again. And, and that leads to the saying, we remember more than we recall. Recollection, the ability to recall something is, is a certain, certain type of memory retrieval. But if you've ever been at an exam and you know the answer, but you can't pull it out, but you know you know it, it's just failing you. Let's call it like the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Then you know that you can remember more than you recall. And if somebody gave you a hint, then you'd be able to quickly pull that information out, demonstrating that it was in fact stored. Retrieval refers to the reactivation or even reconstruction, because memory is pretty constructive, of experiences from your memory stores. And forgetting can be a failure of, of retrieval. And retrieval is, is reconstructive. Back in when I was younger, you know, in 2004, when we didn't all have phones, people would sometimes have a strategy of, of tying a um, string around their finger to remember something. And, and I tried that, but sometimes I would like, so you see the string, you know that you were supposed to do something, but then, then I'd forget what I was supposed to do. So I didn't find it was the most effective strategy. Now I have a smartphone. Uh, hints can help us remember what we were trying to remember, okay, those are called retrieval cues. So the string around the finger is a, I'd say not particularly good retrieval cue. There are three ways that psychologists assess memory. They're called the three R's. 
is recall, recognition, and relearning. Recall refers to your ability to generate the previously remembered information. A practical example of that is a fill in the bank blank test question. You have to pull that, that term in, that you learned out of your memory bank. That's harder than recognition. In recognition, you select the previously remembered information from an array of options. And a good practical example of that is a multiple choice test question. So multiple choice questions tend to be easier than fill in the blank questions because the answer is right there in front of you. You just have to recognize it. Then the third way is called relearning. If you have learned something in the past, if you've learned to skate, okay, it will be faster for you to learn it again a second time. So if you learned to skate as a kid, now you've been off the ice for 10 years. When you go back on the ice, you'll, you know, you'll be pretty, pretty shaky because, you know, your muscles have atrophied while you've been sitting at your desk studying. But you will learn it a lot faster than a first time skater. Okay. So that's an example of relearning. We are now um, 10, at 1020. I got further ahead than I anticipated. Um, I will stop the recording here and be available for any questions.